Hey everyone, it's Classic DM and Paizo has released a very interesting, very cool demo adventure. And this video is going to dig into it in lots of details to show you all things that are really strong about it, things that are really interesting, things that will benefit brand new players and existing players, and some of my personal thoughts about some of the things that maybe aren't as strong as they could have been. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on it, right? So uh, basically we have this demo adventure they've released. They haven't done this previously. You have the fall to play stone, but that's actually like a commercial release. you got to buy it, things like that. So this is actually 100% free. It's on the Paizo blog, and I'm going to show you in this video how to actually find it because the Paizo blog can sometimes be um, tricky to navigate if you're not used to navigating. It took me, even myself, a while to get where, okay, I've got to be able to find this stuff relatively quickly. So I'm going to show you exactly how to find this thing right away. Um, it has a huge Game Master focus, so it's really written for the Game Master to, to download it, grab it, and get ready to play it and host the game for someone else. It's not really a player guide. Um, it's not like an introduction to the world or any kind of particular uh, lore mythology for someone to get their head wrapped around. It's not an introduction to all the classes, so it's not like a huge game demo. It's not like <clears throat> the first book zero of Traveler or something like that. It's not like the introductory free demo version of the entire game system. It's an actual play session demo module. It's an adventure, right? So. It has a lot of information in there about game explanation and, uh, explanation, and it's really useful. Even for someone who, like me, has been studying the game since it came out on like the 1st of August, there's still elements in the core rulebook that I haven't been able to put into practice just yet on the game table and go, oh, crap, I'm not really sure how that works. Let me go look it up in the CRB. There's a really good, concise game explanation. There's some tools for someone running the campaign who maybe isn't themselves feeling confident about what's in the core rulebook. Um, that's in this demo module. It's very condensed, very, very well done. There's a map situation going on. Um, I have some kind of personal pet peeves with that, but it's just a personal pet peeve. But they, ha they, they have a map design that they're going to suggest you use a previous release commercial flip map. Um, but we'll talk about that really briefly. It doesn't take anything away from the adventure. It's just an option. It's not something you have to do. Um, the, there's a, the adventure itself is... You know, it's got a lot of combat, it doesn't have a lot of exploration mode, doesn't have a lot of storytelling, but there's elements to it that we want to talk about because you may want to change some of it yourself, but if you really want to run this for players who are super combat oriented or coming from another tabletop game, they're going to get into it right away. They're going to already know how to do other modes, but if you have a family or a friend or a kid or a child playing or someone who's never played before and plays other games, um, the game, this module is really not totally tailored towards them. Not taking away from it. You know, we've got a few tick marks that are going on. You're probably logging in the back of your mind here saying, oh, this sounds like he doesn't like it. No, I like it. I think it's great. I think it's really, really strong. I think it does a great job of giving something that someone can run at a game store or with some friends on a weekend who already play these kinds of games and haven't played the system because it's very system centric. So we're also going to talk about uh, some of the reference content they included. They included a really done, well done two page spread of the references for the conditions and the weapon traits and some of the rules and the flow of gameplay. It's like taking the how to play the game chapter and distilling it down really, really quickly. And they included pre-generated characters, which are a little bit different than the iconic uh, uh, Pathfinder Society ones that were done the game the day the game was released. The Pathfinder Society folks went ahead, used all the existing Wayne Reynolds art, and created their own kind of character sheets from scratch and released these two-page, three-page iconic character sheets. And I've talked about them in previous videos. They've done the same thing here, but they're different. And there's more information for someone who's new to the game. And so it's kind of tailored more towards a brand new player, maybe coming from D&D 5th Edition or something like that. So that's really interesting. Let's go into the details. Now, where are you going to get this thing? Right off the bat. So just go to paizo.com. The paizo.com is the best place to start at the web page. And the... The web page that you use at Python, it's one of these, like, you got to scroll a lot, right? So you open, there's a thing at the top, you know, Pathfinder, Unleash Your Hero, Learn More, boom. That's the new product line. That's the new books. That's fantastic. But the blog, as you can see, even on a 1080p screen, I use big screen HD monitors and HD TVs for my monitors. You know, the blog's kind of cut off. So you got to kind of peek down here. It says newest Paizo blogs because this section is updated a lot. And I mean, sometimes two and three times a day. So, you know, depending upon when you're watching this video, you're going to see something kind of like this. It kind of has this old school message board kind of look to it. It doesn't look like a standard kind of web page. You got a lot of white space, a lot of empty stuff. It really is kind of set up like a forum, to tell you the truth. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just very clean and easy for them to manage. It's very simple and straightforward. Uh, so when you find it, when you look at it and you've clicked on that link I showed you in the previous link here that says read more, right? You're going to find it's going to kind of look like this. Give a little icon, thumb, thumbnails on the right, title of the article on the left, 
click on the show post, you know, not article, show post, and then it'll actually take you to the article itself. Another way you can find it is if you try to do it this way, by the time you watch this video, it's going to be week, two weeks, a year since this thing's been posted. You'd have to scroll forever and start going through the archive. So one thing you can actually do is do a quick search. And you can go to the search bar at the top and just type in Demo Adventure. If you type in Demo Adventure at the top, you're going to have this, you know, four column thing across the top that's going to say product type and product category manufacturer and price and ratings it's like very confusing and for someone trying to find something quickly it sounds it makes you feel like gee my search listed three soft covers and 60 20 systems 11 ogls seven world works games one six piezo items one atlas games ratings from one star to four star I, did i did it find it did i even find it it doesn't say your search results are a you have to scroll down. So once again, the website kind of makes you scroll down. Unless you're one of these guys or girls who likes to zoom out by holding down the control wheel and zoom your web browser to be like 60% view as opposed to 100% view, you got to scroll down because the first entry will be this Pathfinder 2nd Edition Demo Adventure Torment and Legacy PDF. It's free, right? So once you, you can find it that way because if you're watching this video later on, this first method I showed you here, you, you're going to have to scroll forever. You're eventually going to have to get to like an archive page and try to navigate. So this is probably the fastest way to get your hands on it, right? So once you actually find one of these things, you see these pages with all the different things, you need to click on show post. They're always considered kind of like a web posting, like a forum posting. Now they're set up like a web page, but they're really kind of postings because everyone can comment on them. So they've always maintained that kind of relationship with the community. They don't just post something saying, you know, here it is, Eberron Gollum's whoopee, go buy it now. They, they always have everything oriented around, it's a community, read the forum posting, it's a blog, it's a web log, right? We have comments, we have some links, we show you cool stuff you can check into with all the different games that they make. So when you click on the show post thing, then you're going to get down to something that looks like this, right? So here's the actual shot of the whole article. Now, right off the bat, you're going to say, here's what it's about. It was released on September the 11th. Um, the free PDF download link is right there at the top. And down below, there's some suggested supplies. And I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. But overall, you get a good sense of what the theme is. It's free. It's a free demo adventure. It's not a demo of the game. It's a demo adventure, but it's got enough of the game in it to run it. Now, they do suggest you have, obviously, a Pathfinder Core rulebook. They also make some other suggestions, which uh, are like, you know, here's some things you could buy to make it cool, but you don't really need to do that. Um, they suggest using the Flip Mac Classics Hill Country or the, the Combat Pad and the Pathfinder Hero Point tokens. You don't need to really do any of that. If you're such on a budget, you're just trying to game out and never played it before, you don't need to do any of that. But if you're someone who wants to go all in, you know, you probably already got the CRB anyway. But it does have the download link. It does have the suggested supplies. They're very cool about, you know, promoting the archives of Nethys, if that's pronounced it correctly, which is this 2e.aonprd.com. You know, back when OGL first started, they had a thing called the System Reference Document, which is essentially a Word document version of all the core rules with all the um, IP-specific license type stuff you're never allowed to use, like Lolf or stuff like that, pulled out. So you would find Drow in there, but you wouldn't find Lolf, or you wouldn't find a Clavger or anything like that. So this uh, SRD method has been around since the OGL, or Open Game License, has started since the year 2000 or so with 3rd Edition D&D, &D, and it's really fantastic. The thing is, that means that the rules for the game are open game license material. They're available for anyone for free. So the archives of Nethys, in essence, is the OGL for second edition of Pathfinder. They also have the OGL for first edition. In fact, you can get the SRD for the fifth edition of D&D &D as well. It's not the same. It's not as cool. But if, you want to if you're a real web searcher kind of a person, really good at searching the web, like, hey, I need to find out what this feat does for the Barbarian with Rage, you, know, you may want to look that up really, really quickly here, or what this deadly feat does in the weapon. You forgot what that meant. And does, is it? versatile or is it deadly so that web link there don't click on it it's in a video it's blue it doesn't mean you can click on it that will take you to the archives of Nethys, and you can look things up relatively quickly um, it has suggested play environments in the the, the web blog posting say hey this would be great to take to a game store get with four to six of your friends um, and they ask you for feedback and here's a free demo go play it it's set up to be kind of freestanding you don't need a lot of additional materials here's some cool materials to make it cooler and you've actually found the blog entry so now you know Every day that you're into the game, you want to do something, bookmark this page, right? Go down here to the read more part and click the read more and read these things every day. I try to read them every single day. 
you know, hey, Knights Ever Flame episode came out. Or there's lots of flash fiction that's put in there. Um, there's all kinds of releases that are in there, and stuff can get buried because if you don't really pay attention to it, they're so prolific at releasing stuff sometimes two, three, four, five times a day. I mean, even look at the screen here. You can see that there was Knights Ever Flame returns for season two on Thursday at two, Thursday at Thursday at one. They're talking about Lost Omen Sea to Hope, and by Friday at four and Friday again at five. And within an hour, there's two separate postings happening. That's actually kind of nice. Um, I can't think of any other role-playing game developer in the world that, that is that prolific with communicating with their community. So no negativity from me on that one. That's great. Hard to navigate, but once you get the hang of it, it's not that big of a deal. And remember, you can always search. Anything on the web lets you search. Okay, let's get into some more of the details. This part here is kind of strange to me on a personal level. And I'm not going to bash these guys because they're... I love what they're doing. I think what they're doing is brilliant. They're resurrected the game that I've loved my entire life, right? My whole career has been defined by this kind of game. The Pathfinder Core rulebook link is right there. So if you're getting the demo adventure, like, hey, cool, I can, I've ordered the, the rulebook. I hadn't got it. Amazon dropped the ball, and the truck flipped on the highway somewhere and caught on fire and burned to death in the forest. Um, you can get the Core rulebook link right here, right? Obviously, you need dice if you never played before. The Flip Map Classics Hill Country thing, you know, you don't really need that. I actually kind of wish, this is me being wishful, I'm going to talk like a player now, not a critic. I'm not trying to be a critic. You don't really need that. I wish they'd just given you an extra page and put some kind of made-up map in there. You don't really need the flip, the flip map. They're cool, and I think the reason why they're surfacing this for you is so you can actually remember that these guys do make really, really nice, high-resolution, they're like 24 by 36 flip maps. You can draw on them wet or dry erase markers. Uh, they're really good. They're fantastic. If you want to come up with a, you can't draw maps. My maps are like chicken scratch, right? If you aren't some digital artist, they have beautiful 3D maps they've made. And they're great. They're not very expensive either. And you can do them in PDF form as well. So I think, you know, their goal here isn't to try to trick you into buying some, you know, flip map from a long time ago that wasn't moving or shifting well. I think what they're trying to do is surface that this is a cool way to play with your friends. There's no links in the miniatures or anything, which is, would have been kind of cool. But but they do um, mention, like, hey, you want to try the combat pad, which allows you to kind of mark and track what's going on with the game as you know, for tracking initiative and who gets to go in what order, which is really useful. You don't really need that as well. The Hero Point tokens is cool. I think it's a neat idea they're doing these things. They should randomly mail these out to anyone who's uh, <laughs> who's bought stuff from them. I think if you spend over $5,000 with them, they should send you one for free. Um, so anyway, that's the basic details of the blog entry. Let's get into the actual content itself. You know, as soon as you flip the thing over, you see that you know Stephen Radney McFarlane, I believe he stepped away from Paizo and he's doing his own thing. I've seen his LinkedIn postings about Dell, the game he's designing. You know, he had a kind of a posting he did back in late, in, uh, late was it late July, saying that he's stepping away to do his own thing, and but he's going to do something else. He still may do some of this, some of that, so maybe he's doing some contract work for them. But this is written by him, and there's a lot of really great things in here I really like. And the one thing right off the bat that's really, really good is sidebars. These guys are using sidebars very efficiently in their new publications. And so they really jump off the page. You know, because you look at a page that has this kind of like wall of text, wall of text, header, 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 wall of text, and you see a sidebar. And there's something about the sidebar. It's like, a, it's like the inside jacket of a book. You kind of want to read what's in the movie, right? What you'll need right off the bat. They tell you right away what you're going to need. They suggest the same kind of things they said earlier on the web blog, right? What dice you need, how you can get a flip map. The introductory paragraph's really super clean. They're saying, hey, this is four to six players. Now, in all the stuff I've heard so far, the game's really kind of anchored towards four players, but you think to yourself, well, gosh, how are they going to do this with six players? Well, it really kind of depends. They do, uh, Stephen offers ways for you to ramp up the difficulty by adding an additional enemy in there, which is really great, but there's no real tips on how to ramp it down. So that thing's kind of tricky, and that's why you heard me say earlier that something like this is great for someone who's already played tabletop role-playing games. If you played D&D, you played Vampire the Masquerade or Traveler or whatever you play, it doesn't matter. Any of the games you played, you know how to destroy stuff, right? You know how to work as a group. You know how to use your character build to do things. Even if you're an MMO or Diablo player, you probably know how to do this stuff, right? So there's no real tips on how to scale it down. So a lot of people are getting killed and, and plague some because there's a lot of new thinking that people aren't used to. It doesn't mean it's not balanced. It just means people are doing their old habits, right? It's like people who play Call of Duty who come play PC shooters, play Call of Duty on console, come play PC shooters, they get destroyed. They get destroyed because they can't play with mouse and keyboard players. They don't think the same. They don't move the same. Mouse and keyboard players move very differently than console gamers. In any event, it does have a section down below which concludes the setup of what the how to set the game up, how to set the table up. The thing I want to draw your attention to here is the second page. 
This game introduction is really, really good. It's really well written. It's written in a way with little bars so you'd actually just verbatim read it out loud. You can just read this out loud to your friend. If you're not good at explaining something to someone, someone's like, yeah, so how does it work now? What's the deal with this? You know, what, what's the difference between a turn and a round? If you sat down and read these two columns to someone, you know, it tells you exactly what the idea behind the game is. How does it work? What's different in this new edition? What the little icons mean for a single action? for two action activity, three action activity, reaction, free action. It talks about how if you get hit, how the armor class works. So, you know, while you read that to someone, they're actually kind of guiding you how to run the session. You know, everyone's reviewing their character sheets that are included because it does have pre-generated characters. And you've kind of read this to everyone. They're kind of like, hmm, that sounds pretty straightforward. It's not too complicated. You can field questions along the way, if you, especially if you know how to play the game well. I thought that was really good because this is speaking, this is giving an inexperienced game master who's anxious to really become a great game master. Maybe they've watched some of these streams or someone's a really great entertaining game master or they want to do it because their friend's really good at it or the oldest in the neighborhood and the other kids are younger or it's mom and dad and they've never done it before. The way this is written is strong. And a lot of role-playing game books never do this. They always give you this kind of omniscient description of like, this is a role-playing game, here's what happened, boy, is it going to be fun for you and your friends. And even the introductory chapter in the CRB, it's very good at doing that too. Here's what's new, here's what's changed, here's what, you know, trained and expert and master and, you know, all these kind of stuff. You know, it explains all this stuff really, really well, but it's not written in a way that you can read it to somebody else to explain to them how it works. Like, oh, okay, a stride does this and a strike does that. I got it. If you get, what's the token do? What's the, it's called a hero point. Okay. So this part's really good. I'm not sure who wrote that, but whoever wrote that did a really good job. Really, it's really good. It's not easy to write that kind of stuff because every single word counts and every minor example like drawing a weapon or opening a door you know those things count because those little memories in someone's mind like okay dropping a weapon on the ground is free opening a door costs me an action and that's the examples that they will live with in their mind as they think about playing the game more and more and more from there we kind of get right into the adventure um you know the first left this is i've got this thing set to be folded open it's a pdf as if it's opened like a book right so on the left-hand side, you have the introduction. They have kind of this backstory. There's this you know, person in the village that's been you know, ceremoniously picked up by an ogre and stuffed in a backpack and taken off, right? And everyone's like, oh, no, someone took Grandpa, and let's go to rescue Grandpa. And the young girl says, I'll give you 20 gold coins by life savings if you go rescue Grandpa. You know, and his name is uh, Lazino or something, right? And a little girl's name or young girl, the daughter's or granddaughter's name is Layla. So no reference to uh, famous guitar players. But there's a little bit of a missed opportunity here, and this is just my creative director of game industry, you know, feedback. You know, it's not going to stick in the in the pen and paper world, but I just want to share this because it's something I like to see us do more of as, as designers is when you're introducing a game to someone and they're getting a chance to play it, you know, this demo works really, really well for having a character and doing actions and killing things. The backstory is kind of glossed over. It's kind of like, yeah, rescue this guy that you don't know, you have no relationship with. Because new players might get a little bogged down with trying to, you know, role play the town, find where the inn is, meet with Leia, hear what happened. They're not going to be there when the ogre is actually making the kidnapping. Otherwise, they would start attacking right away. You've got, imagine you have six players on the table and the ogre runs in town. Everyone just tackles the guy and beats the crap out of their end of adventure. There's no hill country flip map needed at that point. So, but there's a little bit of a missed opportunity here for me personally because the idea of hearing about this bad thing that just happened yesterday and having the village like the Magnificent Seven saying, these Mexican bandits are destroying our town. Can you please do something about it, right? I mean, a lot of these inciting incidents in films and books are always like, there's a problem at hand. You know, here's the catalyst for the situation. Can you go do something about it? But you only really get one paragraph and it just kind of says, you trace his trail and you find a dead cow along the way and there he is on the top of the hill. So just boom, it's like, brrr, it's like there it goes. The players didn't get to play that. Now in the video game industry, we try to say, try not to do that. Try not, and when you're writing a novel, you show, you know, don't tell. You don't tell someone that, you know, that Conan traveled on the seas for a long, long time with Bleat until they grew up. You, know, you don't say that. You take them on the entire adventure and see what happened. That's only my only missed opportunity kind of criticism. It would have been nice to see something here that would guide a new game master as to how to handle 
uh, picking up the job or uh, accepting the quest, what if you want to call it that way, or talking with Leia and uh, Layla and what the problem was and how the other villagers are on edge and how one person in the village can tell you which way he thinks the ogre went, warned you about some of the fields are out there, maybe a little map sketch of the field, not that village of Hamlet kind of vibe, right? Wow, I'm in this cool Middle Ages style village and there's these characters and I got this cool thing I'm going to do, um, but I'm going to do it for 20 gold coins. I don't know why. I'm not really motivated. I don't have a rapport. There's no picture of what the girl looks like. Can I see a picture of her? So those little details like that, it's how Pimlin gets really kind of bought into a character. Even when you're watching a film, you know, you see these characters on screen or if you're reading a novel. Seeing the character you're interacting with and hearing their cries and their dilemma and your reason for doing something is really important. One thing you'll notice that Jason did in the Knights of Everflame is when all those characters are together, like they can introduce themselves to each other. They're all kind of awkward and weird. They're like, hey, I'm not sure how to do this and I look like this and I look like that. He <laughs> he. And they're kind of awkward. So it kind of breaks the ice. In this situation, there's no real guidance for that. So as I said previously, it's more like, you guys already know how to play. Here's an adventure to go play. Try Test drive the car. You already know about cars. You already know about horsepower. You already know about clutches and transmissions. So it's kind of a missed opportunity because it just completely skips exploration mode. So it just goes, almost pretty much goes right into encounter mode. So for the let's get to the action and don't do any exploration or, or detective work or doing any skill checks or talking to characters or buying something or trading or trading the shield in for a two-handed sword because you're playing Valeris, you want to play a two-handed sword instead and you realize he could do that if you wanted to. There's none of that Baldur's Gate first level type stuff going on where you're selling crap and raiding junk everywhere. Maybe something could have been done there. I'm guessing that for brevity, to keep it simple and get right to the action for a one-hour game session, they skipped all that, which in some ways is kind of a disservice because a lot of the game is that. A lot of, the, a lot of these kinds of games, not just Pathfinder 2, a lot of these kinds of games are the human experience which we do every day, right? You go to the grocery store, you're walking up and down the aisles, unless you gotta memorize, you're in exploration mode, right? So you know, you're going on a trip somewhere and visiting some town you've never been to, you're in exploration mode. The figuring out puzzles in ancient tombs, you know, finding old tomes, talking to an ancient wizard, all those kind of fantastical elements that happen in Lord of the Rings movies, right? There's not always Ring Race battling Aragorn for 120 minutes for every single episode. There's all kinds of stuff happening in between. So I kind of wish there was something in there. Even if it was just the 125-word paragraph in here, that would have been great. So if you were a game master and you're going to try to run this, I would encourage you to elevate your game and take that red-pink block and add something to it. Make it really interesting. Like there's smoke on the horizon. Um, it's in a series of caves where the notorious oak orc war bands are. You can hear the drums at night. That sounds kind of dangerous. We've got to go over there where there's war drums and fires at night. But when you get over there, you just encounter the ogre guy, right? But build up some drama to that. Anyway, let's go about the flip map. So they have this tiny little picture of the flip map, and it's not super useful. Um, the reason why it's not super useful is it, it talks about elements like this cave and these standing stones, but if you look at the flip map, there's no real cave. It's just like a cave entrance. Now, it does have a really cool you know, topography with little cliffs and a winding path. There's a winding path that someone's been going up and down, and they have these little rocks here, everything, some boulders and places to hide for cover, etc. There's boulders, and there's a cliff that talks about a fire, but you don't see the fire on the map, so you don't really have an idea like where it is. So... It's kind of confusing for someone who's never run this before to understand where to put something. Not everyone who's playing a map uh, is a level designer, right? Not everyone who's playing a game for the first time understands which part of this is the cave and which part of this is actually just trail. You know, some people might be, is this actually inside the cave or it's not? Now, I know it's not because I can see the grass and I can see the little trail and I can see the stones, but I don't see any standing stones. That's just a personal kind of pet peeve. That's why it kind of bugged me about the uh, hill country thing being kind of shoehorned in here i kind of wish that maybe something had been made custom f just for this it just need to be a, a, a pd it's a pdf anyway just make it a page in a pdf just like they did in age of, in uh plague stone and if all plague stone there's like 10 12 maps in that baby right just use that map style make one page with a cool map have a little cave have all the dudes junk in the cave outside the cave is is his you know his fire going where he's got his captured prisoner and all this kind of business that's the only thing i would say so this first part is you're kind of thrust into the combat. Boom, you're at the bottom of the hill. You can sneak up the hill. There's some descriptions of how to do the, you know, stealth slash perception checks to see who sees who first. And you're getting right into combat. And phase one, which is basically where the title of the whole adventure comes from, Torment and Legacy, is the torment phase. They call this this ogre warrior a tormentor. So the stat blocks, 
they're perfect. They're always perfect. They're great. I love them. I love the choices they made with the colors. I love the layouts. I've got them memorized already. They work really well. When I first saw them, I was like, whoa, these are weird. Um, there's no really great picture of the ogre in here, but there is on the web page. So when you have the PDF download, it would have been nice to have had the picture from the web page put in the PDF. So someone could say, he looks like this. You know, hold a picture up. Here's a guy. He's, oh, goodness, he looks crazy. Another thing that's kind of tricky, this is me being totally, totally nitpicky, right? So you see this guy here, right? Now, what's he look like he's wearing? Kind of looks like a female, right? Kind of like, kind of like a, either that or do they drink too much beer. It's got this kind of Arctic kind of Wrath of the Lich King axe going on, you know, living up in the mountains. But then when you uh, when you go over to the search bar, there's a different ogre down at the bottom. <laughs> so at the very end of the whole slide thing, you'll see that like, you know, the different type of, well, not the different ogre pictures are can be a little confusing. I think that would have been something that been nice to do. Since it's a PDF, there's no real major cost with the additional layout time to put the picture of the ogre on the same page as the ogre warrior and have some of the rules help sidebar on another page because that's something that's done very, very well in the bestiary. So the bestiary does a great job of, you know, every single page you open up, you know, you've got these two pages open up and there's a picture on the left and there's a picture on the right. And the stat blocks are in the middle and it tells you everything you need to know. So that, that would have been a nice touch. Um, there's reasons why they did this. You know, this is just my personal opinion. It doesn't take away from the quality. This thing is free. I mean, come on. Now, they, um, Stephen does include this mitflit, whatever that is. I'm not sure what that is. It's some kind of um, little creature, I guess. I don't really know what it is. Uh, it, it's a gremlin-like creature. I'm not familiar with it. I'm, I'm an old-school AD&D guy. I'd have to look that guy up. But this is something you can add to the adventure to make it uh, harder if the group of six is too good and too experienced. There's no real mention of how to make it easier. So that's why I have this comment that says adjust down for new players. So, you know, if you're playing this for two people, because not everyone can get four. Sometimes you can get three people or like I've done one person, one person playing two characters, another person playing two characters. And you got these two human beings controlling four characters total doing this battle against this ogre warrior. Now his perception number is kind of low. Um, his speed is basically the same. His hit points is decent. It's not incredible. But this guy is really nasty uh, t to hit rolls. I mean, it's plus 12, deadly weapon with 1d10 damage, 10-foot reach. So you're not only are you fighting something larger than you, um, it's something that can reach you. It, you know, it can do some pretty nasty damage. Uh, the trip attack is pretty nasty. He's, he's a decent little nasty guy. Uh, I worry about that being... Uh, Someone getting blown open in one in one melee round, you know, one in one turn. This ogre warrior, as a game master, it would have been great to have some tips here on how to tone down the ogre from being too aggressive um, and things like that. Because you want people to walk away from this demo session having fun, and that's a key point about this kind of a demo thing. It's so hard to balance. Like, how much information do we want to do? Do we want to ramp it down? Or do we want to ramp it up? Anyway, as usual, the giant Sitted Pete is also listed in there for another way to ramp up the difficulty of the ogre. He's a cool enemy. I don't really have a problem with him or anything. It does make lynch mention of the core rulebook references are all over the place about how to do treat wounds and all this kind of stuff. So this uh, hook is a really nasty weapon. Um, so someone's going to get hurt really bad in this encounter. I don't, no matter what happens, if he lands a hit on you, you're going to really, really, really get hurt. Let's go on from there. So... We go from this section to this phase two. You defeat the ogre, you kill the guy, yay. Kill the stinky centipede, eh, you know, whatever. Um, then you got this Hanar and Lazino sequence. And this is basically like, you know, they say 10 minutes after the fight has happened, you can read or paraphrase the following, which is good. They, the standing stones out far from the ogre begin to glow with emerald green. And from the light steps forth a young man, his features distorted with rage. He has an otherworldly look to him as if he's not entirely human. It's like a ghost just appears out of this. Uh, and there you are, Sage. I see you've brought friends, but it doesn't matter. You will tell me the truth of my birth. So it's like, whoa, that sounds kind of scary. What's going on with that? But then the next section kind of, kind of tones back down really quickly where we have Lazino um, and Hanar. We understand that there's some kind of relationship happened in the past. And, you know, one character is talking to the other character and they try to settle things down. And it's even suggested that you use the make an impression rules on 246 of the core rule book. So it's kind of a letdown. You know, they either like most players are going to be like, kill him, <laughs> kill the dude with the two handed staff, you know. But there is an opportunity to kind of talk your way, top secret style, kind of talk your way out of the situation. There's a lot of real estate used in this section here to talk about that option. But it, 
doesn't seem that an otherworldly creature stepping out of a standing stone is going to be thinking like that. So it kind of felt detached for me personally. It wasn't like you discovered someone in a cave who's a human being that's going through a human emotional distress and they feel like this is what's happened to them. It's all been a big misunderstanding. You know, I read your journal and it said this. You know, it doesn't feel human. When the otherworldly type creature, it feels like, oh my goodness, this is some crazy ghost specter hit dice eight thing. It's going to kill all of us, you know players reactions are probably going to be kill it you know so um i doubt that very many people will have this make it impression rules and if you've never played a role-playing game like this before i doubt very seriously that a new player will ever say well let's maybe negotiate and figure this out we'll parlay i, I don't think that would happen but i'm not going to be too negative about it because you know there's a couple of little this is just personal opinion man i'm, I'm not a, an official paizo critic but the thing i want to mention about this is in the video game industry one thing we try to always remind ourselves, and some games refuse to do this even to this day, AAA games still do this, is make sure the story is about the player. That means if you're playing Red Dead Redemption and Buck and Billy are riding horses in the snow next to you and they're talking about some random crap, that's just because they're buying time while you move from location A to location B. They're setting the tone. They're talking about tidbits of information that might be relevant to you. It's the same thing in Uncharted, right? You've got two characters talking in the background while you're navigating. You know, you kind of get a sense of what the personality of one character is. That's all like backstory being revealed in real time. That's very interesting. But when you play a Call of Duty game, it's like, bam, there's Kevin Spacey. He's go ahead and kill him. You know, you railroaded right through the whole thing. So you are this, you know, agnostic hero. If you look at the Black Ops covers of all the Black Ops, but uh, um, all the, the, the covers of all those video games, you'll see it's like, okay, uh, I'm just a shadowy figure with two pistols crossed. I, it could be me. That's right, because I'm going to be the best multiplayer player in the world. So a lot of the shooter world and a lot of the AAA game world, like, they either put you in the role of a character like Batman or the Tomb Raider girl, and you have to kind of watch her act the way she acts, or it's a game where you can be who you want to be, but then the story doesn't pull you into it enough. You're a spectator. So it's a very difficult line. No one's nailed it yet. It's a very difficult line to cross. You, are you watching the Vikings? Are you reading the Vikings? Are you reading about first person or third person on this narration? So in a role-playing game, we can actually do things that these other forms of media like video games and books and Netflix series can't do. We can make the storyline about you. Like the storyline can be about one of the characters in the group. It doesn't have to be about Lazino and Hanar and the hag and the bad weekend and drinking too much that they had. So there's nothing wrong with this. It's a good, you know, local problem for the players to go get involved in and check out the local problem. It sounds like you guys have some promiscuous issues going on. That's cool. We understand. It sounds like dad didn't work out and this guy's a bad apple now, you know, you know, so that's fine. But the players aren't really connected to this. And they're maybe not supposed to be. Like, okay, well, we help these guys. Where's our 20 bucks? You know, so it has this kind of... Um, Pay me my money, you know, if you, if you know what I'm saying. It's like an Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12 kind of thing after being evil Knievel. Pay me my money. So Chuck Berry said that every night coming on stage. So once you get past this sequence, um, there's really good sidebars I mentioned before, about like how the Hanar changeling exile his spells, how they work. Um, that's really, really useful. It gives you some ideas on how to play him. That's really, really useful. The very last section on the far right-hand side is ending the adventure, which is kind of like, Okay, they've either rescued Hanar and brought him back to town, and he has a long road to travel to change who he is from recovering from being in exile, even though he's a emerald green, half translucent, not entirely human weirdo guy. It's just like, what? How's this guy going to come integrate? How's he? Is he going to sweep floors at the end now? What's going on with that? So, that part kind of felt strange. If there was some kind of transformation of Hanar and Lazino, it's like a Final Fantasy scene. If Lazino calmed Hanar down and he transformed back into a normal boy again, like Pinocchio or something, then it might be like, oh, great, we're going to bring the normal Hanar, his long lost grandson, back to town. And wow, what a human story. But the way it is right now, we have this glowing dude who came out of a. Uh, <laughs> He, he steps out of a rock, and he's really pissed off. But now he's cool, and he's going to sweep floors at the end. So he's got a long road to travel, got to make some money to pay his debt to society. So that part I thought was a little disconnected. But, hey, it's a fantasy game. Whatever. The players are going to get, in the, get on their horses and take off and go look for more things to kill down the road, right? So the other thing I thought was kind of tricky here is, you know, below the wolf, which is kind of like adding an additional creature to ramp up the difficulty for when you're playing this Hanar guy, this phase two of the legacy battle, which is really crazy. Now, we all know that wolves have been... Um, um, blowing people up in <laughs> in the fall of Plague Stone. So you have to be careful with the wolf there. Usually pretty nasty. Uh, the knockdown is nasty. 
I mean, read the rules. Read the read the Facebook group in this past week. If you're watching this video, it's like September the 16th. Read the knockdown for the wolf and the beast cherry, and read the knockdown for the fighter, and you can tell me what the difference is. It's owl getting knocked prone with no save is nasty. Getting back on top of here, the pink areas. Why do I have pink areas here? It's not my favorite color. This is this is empty empty real estate. So additional information could have gone here. In my personal opinion. The, the first two to the left could have been additional tactical elements for Hanar the Changeling. You could even put information like if you defeat Hanar, he doesn't actually die and he transforms back into a young man and he asks for mercy and then leans to go, oh my God, it's him and uh, don't help. You know, there could have been a dramatic moment there where it feels like no longer is this strange looking translucent non-human type of entity. Something cool like that could have happened. The GM advice would have been like how to handle the wolf, like make sure the wolf doesn't just go for Ezra all the time, <laughs> you know, something like that. Like, Hey, the cleric gets to win. In the, the Kira is winning initiative with her high wisdom. Yay. And she's getting knocked down repeatedly. So, oops. So it'd be nice that the GM vice uh, section could give you some more tactics about target selection. Like Hanar is really mad. He's going to go for Lazino. Whoever happens to be closest to Lazino has the option to step in front of him and defend him. Or does Lazino actually get wounded and damaged? Does Lazino get flat out shot in the face and killed? Does he get his brains blown on top of the, vehicle like in Pulp Fiction you have to go to Mr. Fox's house afterward I mean so there could have been some interesting information in there about how to run it and that's the kind of stuff that GMs um, learn after decades and it would be really awesome because these guys that work on at Paizo have been doing this for decades and it would be great to hear that extra little tidbit of super pro advice here on how to run this encounter to really really be captivating without t railroading it down my throat but telling you know when you run this encounter make sure the wolf is runs up first he's got the faster movement rate it's 35 feet versus you know 25 feet of hanar the wolf's just going to immediately go for whoever's the closest or the wolf's going to go straight for lazino so someone needs to stop the wolf from getting on lazino knocking him down and if the wolf causes a knockdown the hanar is going to try to whack him over the head with the two-handed style with his staff and whoever that is lazino is going to get one shotted right he's going to get knocked out like jose aldo so those are the kind of tidbits that would have been really cool to have there a little bit of extra paragraph would have been nice the last comment i'll say about the ending of the adventure section is you know it kind of ends abruptly um you return to the town with the pcs they thank you and uh, you get your 20 gold reward and when the story's done thank everyone for playing pathfinder second edition wait a minute wait a minute. there's more to that right there's a, i mean so it would be neat to have a section here that kind of written like this first page here this awesome game introduction you see in the upper right hand corner this part right here i would love to have seen something about like this telling me and selling me on everything else you get to do in the game like crafting and making magic items and visiting ancient kingdoms and going to absalon or or all the different cultures and all the different backgrounds and what's happened with the chain of events in the world and, and how, how your characters are now empowered to level up and become more powerful and choose more feats and something that kind of, for someone who's never played, right? Something that sells it. Something that says, and here's why you want this convertible. You know, here's why you want it. This is why you want to pay for this pay-per-view card. So that would have been a neat thing to have here is to kind of tip someone off as to what else can happen. Because the way it stands now, it kind of has this World of Warcraft classic kind of quest of basically kill 10 murlocs and then get your 20 bucks or your four silver depends if you're in dark shore or not right so that was kind of a missed opportunity for me i'm uh probably too wishful in my thinking um this is free i mean come on they're, they're doing other things there's other things they're making money they're in business to do this it'd been great to have pathfinder society people maybe do it instead who had been like more than happy to probably put additional information here and let them edit it real quick in half an afternoon um let them do the layout but that's a missed opportunity to me it'd be a great chance to tell people what you can do in the game beyond completing this kind of simple quest of rescue this guy find out the mystery find out what happened return to town safely and then take that from there okay so we want to go through a couple more things here and we're going to wrap up the uh the overall review these last two pages and this is like page eight or so, is a two-page second edition quick reference sheet. This is priceless. This is so good. It's really good. It has all the conditions. It has weapon traits. It has playing the game in like less than two columns. It talks about the three modes of play. Unfortunately, the demo doesn't do anything but encounter mode or down. It doesn't do downtown mode. Doesn't do encounter mode. It pretty much is just exploration. But it's there. And so there's a lot of depth here. It talks about death and dying. That sounds crazy. It gives you a list of little, you know, explain. You can read step and stride and strike and release and seek and see. Oh, that's, mm, interesting. I could jump ten feet. 
at 15 feet, if my speed's 30 or more, well, I'm only 25. Does that mean I can't make 15 foot jump? Can I jump 12? Does that mean athletics check? You know, if this Gogur guy tries to grab me, can I escape? Why would I want to drop prone? Isn't someone going to stomp on my head if I drop prone? Like, those are the kinds of questions that might come into someone's mind who's never played a game that has these kind of designated actions in it. But these two pages are worth their weight in gold. If they just, they should release more of these. <laughs> they really should. But, you know, they've released a book, and it's all in the book anyway. So this was really, really good. I don't think much of this will come into play over the course of the adventure unless the players playing the different pre-generated characters are really hardcore, and they're going to know what to do. So... Most of the stuff on these two pages here is going to benefit the the D and D or Pathfinder player who already knows the game and is looking to see what the subtle nuances and the new nomenclature and the new names for things and how the skill checks work and because it doesn't explain proficiency bonus but it's on the character sheet but it d gives you the information you need to have to kind of roll with it and when they see things like finesse and disarm they go oh, I remember that from 3.0 and backstabber oh that's just on a weapon trait so that this these two pages here are fantastic really really well done let's go on to the rest now the other thing they did here is they included some pre-generated characters. They did a little different twist here. Now on this page here, you see the upper left-hand corner, we see the Pathfinder Society iconic uh, characters that they did where they kind of created their own character sheets. And they didn't take the character sheets from the back of the book. They created their own character sheets and uh, they have these really cool little bars and headers separating all the sections. It's really broken down. Um, what they included in the back of this one is the same kind of artwork, but they, on the right-hand page, um, instead of just having like a long list of all the equipment and spells and abilities, they kind of like pasted their first level stuff right there from the book for you. So you don't need to go flip into the book to figure out what Burning Hands, Light, Detect Magic, and Hand of the Apprentice and Shield Block does. That's fantastic. If I had a character sheet, I'd want to do it that way. I'd want to have like my rule book with my character sheet. And if that's just really, really cool. I almost wish there were cards. I almost wish there were spell cards. You could just have the cards stick in your little pocket. Now, I've got my own spells. Here's the cards for my character. I'm going to play these. And maybe they're going to do that. This is really good. They did this for all of them. So, you know, they include Fumbus and Kira. I'm just going to call her Kara. Um, so the ones at the bottom are the ones that come with the actual uh, demo. The ones at the top are the ones that were done by the Pathfinder Society Iconics. And you can tell that right away, if you look at Fumbus above and Fumbus below, that the Fumbus below has a rules reference. It's like pasted the actual feat or the actual spell from the book, whereas in the Pathfinder Society one, it's a little bit more hardcore designed for the player who already kind of knows the game um, a little bit better. And then they did it also for Ursiel and Sela, the Paladin slash whatever that class is called, Champion. And then Fighter Valeros, although he's looking different directions. I guess he's checking out the two. He's the only character that's looking two different directions. I, I didn't get that. There's something, there must be hidden meaning behind this. This is a red shirt guy question. I noticed that in the demo release that Valeros is looking a different direction. Is there a particular reason why Valeros is now left-handed? In any event, all comedy aside, um, the fact they included the characters with robust decisions already created is great because as you probably heard me say in my previous video to how to get playing, if you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. Rolling up a character for session zero is a bad idea if someone's never played ever, ever, ever before. So in summary, so strong on game mechanics. Even for, for a free demo, and mechanics are there, they're copy and pasted, they're explained, it's giving you characters, strong on starting with characters, missing some exploration opportunities. Would have been great to have a map, would have been great to have, here's a forest, here's a, here's a series of hills, here's some caves, here's some farm fields, that whole like, you know, Frodo and Samwise walking across the field kind of trouble. I mean, all kinds of stuff could have happened. A little picture of the town. It could be a three-horse town, for Christ's sakes. I mean, that would have been really, really nice to have. It's missing the exploration mode. It's combat heavy, which means that depending upon how good everyone is will determine how fun it is. So that puts a lot of uh, reliance on the game master to be able to mitigate the fun factor of this very dangerous combat to ensure the players have fun without feeling like he's cheating. Now the game is balanced, but it's probably balanced for people that know how to play. And for people who don't know how to play, they're probably gonna have a little bit of a trouble. So it's great for D&D &D and tabletop role-playing game players. So it's green, green, green there, right? I think it's tough on new players. I think it's missing elements that connect the fabric of the uh, combat to the, um, the encounter mode, to the exploration mode. It's missing the magic and the theme. And that's why I include these two pictures from Pathfinder 1, you know? When you look at the art, uh, they've always used these iconic characters, right? What do you have? You have heroic moments in exotic locations with friends. You know, whether it's Valeros and Kara on some sinking ship with these crazy sea hags coming up after you, or whether it's Lenny and her snow leopard and the monk, whatever his name is, I've forgotten his name, fighting on some docks, whooping some butt. I mean, 
those were like right out of a film. I mean, they're dramatic. One guy's being upended by the snow leopard. That's that's the magic of fantasy. So I think the demo is a little weak on that because what are we doing? We're going we're going from a town for a promise of twenty bucks to fight an ogre to find a mystical, uh, mystical guy that has some kind of a family issue and return to town and get her cash and get out. So there's a little element in there that's not quite as dramatic. It's balanced and it's simple, but it's really great for the D&D and tabletop role-playing game player, but they're not going to walk away from this game session thinking, man, this game is huge. There's so much stuff here. And you know what? Pathfinder is huge. There are probably over a thousand books, and they are all beautifully illustrated, and tons of locations, and tons of abilities, and tons of rules, and it's so much there. I think the demo does a little bit of a disservice by not selling that more, and I'd like to have seen that sold a little bit more. But then again, my standards are crazy. Even Gordon Ramsay wouldn't eat my food, right? So anyway, that's pretty much our uh, walkthrough of the demo adventure. You definitely should get it. It's free. I showed you how to find it. Check it out. Play it with some people who've played before. See what you think. You know, players are going to be a chance to kind of test drive combat. That's really what this demo is really achieving. And I think Steven did a good job of putting this together, and I'm so happy that Paizo was cool enough to give someone, uh, some of us players, something like this that can be run in a game shop that has enough of the rules in the PDF with the pre-generated characters. They're not having to go find the iconic pre-generated characters and PDFs, which you extract in all these individual files and then print those, and then go find a map over here, and then go bring the core rule book. All those things mean it takes longer. You could be in a game shop and have the guy that owns the place say, oh, you want to run an adventure? Some other guys are going to be here in 20 minutes. We're going to play this demo adventure, Torment and Legacy. I've got a printed copy right here. Do you, uh, let me email you the PDF. Oh, okay, cool. Pick which character you want. Okay, you just want to play this, uh, you want to play Kira? That's cool. We've got another person playing Kira too, but that's cool. Y'all can just rename them. Boom, you're playing. And I think from that perspective, it's successful. That's it for me. Hope you enjoyed this uh, video. Be, as usual, like, subscribe, share with your friends, what have you, and uh, leave a comment. I always engage with people in the community that have cool things to say. It doesn't have to be complimentary, but it can be what your feedback is. And especially if you see something that I missed. If you see something I missed or something you want to express that's a cooler or even a detail that other people didn't realize, be sure to share that with me. I'd also like to know how you ran this, what difficulty level did, was it for the people you played with, and how skillful they were at playing it. Because I have a sneaking suspicion that non-D&D and non-Pathfinder players are going to struggle against this ogre. <laughs> They're going to have a tough time. But anyway, that's it for me, and we'll talk to you later. This has been Classic DM, going over the demo adventure released this past week by Paizo called Torment and Legacy by Stephen Radney McFarlane. Talk to you later. See ya.